Hi, my name is David Anderson, and this is my wife, Sylvia. We have been married for 42 years. As a church, we have been celebrating Stewardship Month. My wife and I were asked to reflect and share our testimony about the fourth principle with you. God can call me into account at any time, and it may be today. In a span of 18 months, I had nine relatives to die and were called into account. Two brothers, two sisters, one sister-in-law, two nieces, and two nephews. Our daughter-in-law's father also died during this time and was called into account nine months after our son and her were married. We miss our family members, but my husband and I rejoice because we know they are in a better place. We were able to reflect on God's word and songs that reminded us of God's faithfulness and that we were not alone going through this hard time. God had gotten us through hard times in the past, and we know God has promised his people eternal life. Our go-to scriptures were Psalm 46.1, which says, God is our refuge and strength, a very pleasant help in trouble. Verse 10, be still and know that I am God. John 3.15 says that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Amen. God calls all of us to be good stewards over family, friends, unsaved, talents, money, relationships, etc. We have to do our best to grow in Christ and have a relationship with him. We need to appreciate each other, love, encourage, and share God's word with each other because we never know when we will be called into account. During the span of those 18 months, we attended all of the funerals. We found joy in knowing that our 10 family members knew the Lord and was now with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What a blessing that was. During that time, we reflected on what we needed to do to improve our own relationship with the Lord. We were also blessed with the opportunity to share God's word with our younger and older family members about the importance of having a relationship with God and making sure they knew where they would go because you never know when you would be called into account. If you don't have a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you need to repent and receive salvation so that when you, your time is up on this earth, you will know without a shadow of a doubt where you are going. Talk with your pastor, deacon, or someone that can introduce you to Christ. You never know when you will be called into account. It could be today. Aren't you glad for David and Sylvia? You know, several times over the past 18 months, I received news of one of these deaths and their family when I was out on the road traveling. And I can think back to calling Dave or Sylvia from wherever airport I was at the time. And what stands out in my memory is the way the Lord gave them grace and strength to trust Him, uh, to testify for Him as they sought to minister to their family and friends. And so the reason why what you heard this morning seems so authentic is because that is really what they believe, and that really is the way that they have chosen to live. What a great example of stewardship. You know, one of the unexpected events in 2016 was the homegoing of Pastor Bob LaFew. And I realize you might say, wow, this is a, a lot of talk about death this morning. Well, we believe in being honest and straightforward here. Death is as natural as life. Plus, because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, we have an answer for death. We have the hope of eternal life, so we can, as the Apostle Paul said, sorrow, but not as those who have no hope. It's like Jesus said to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So, now, the sting of death is removed for those who have placed their faith and trust in Christ. So, so we can talk about it. And friends, we need to talk about it. 
The LaFues came to this church 21 years ago when we asked them to come and um, lead us in starting Faith Christian School. They did a marvelous job with that assignment. And um, I know that there are many families who um, have been tremendously impacted as a result of the school's ministry on you. But what was interesting about Bob and Joan to me in part was they could take any ministry and make it better. They were perfect examples, I think, of stewards who, who could increase what God had given. So, so in addition to the school... At some point along the line, they were asked to, uh, to begin leading our Caleb's Kin ministry, our ministry to senior saints. And they took that ministry and they made it a whole lot better. At some point along the line, they were asked to lead our, our community sports ministry. Now, that wasn't their, their natural calling, so to speak, but, but they built it, that they increased it in unbelievable ways. And after they retired from here and moved closer to one of their sons in North Carolina, and they began serving as greeters almost immediately. I think it was about the second or third week they were in that church. They were asked to serve as greeters. And would anybody in the room be surprised that not long after that, they were asked to lead the greeter ministry in their church? That, that's just the, the way they were. Part of what was surprising about Bob's cancer was how suddenly it occurred. Bob had always been a very strong man. He was an outstanding athlete. He was a Marine. In fact, one of my favorite Bob LaFew memories was not, not long after they came, we, we had built our house and we were installing a, a big basketball coal that had been made up at U.S. Steel. My, my dad worked there. And so we had this big iron basketball pole that we were going to put up to have a, a basketball goal for our, our kids. And so I had a bunch of guys over to the house trying to stand this thing up in this hole, and we were going to brace it and then pour concrete around it and that sort of thing. And at some point in, in that process, the thing started to, to, to fall over. And I'm surely it would have cracked our, our concrete or... or Maybe broke the pole in some way. So, but the young guys, all of us, we scattered because we didn't want to get hit by the pole. We looked around, and there was Bob with the pole on his shoulder. Now, the oldest guy on the job stuck around and caught the pole. That was just the way Bob was. But, but last fall, he began having symptoms that were eventually diagnosed as brain cancer. And we held his memorial service here a couple of weeks ago. You know, when I was studying for the ministry, there were all sorts of aspects of this position that I did not anticipate. One of them was that if you stay in the same place long enough, you'll eventually have the honor and the responsibility to conduct memorial services for longtime co-workers and friends. I'm not sure I can even put that kind of grief into words, but it certainly is a very important part of Stewardship Month. With that in mind, let me invite you to open your Bible now to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, that's on page 20 of the back section of the Bible under the chair in front of you. The, the numbers start over in the New Testament, so go to the back section uh, to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24. Or page 20 of the back section of the Bible under the chair in front of you. As was mentioned, today is the, the last Sunday of Stewardship Month. But I'm sure, like we have every Sunday, there will be some who are brand new with us today. I want you to know we're so glad that you're here. So here's what this is all about. Every November, we take time as individuals and as a church family to consider all that God has entrusted to us and whether we've been faithful and growing, those are the two key words, faithful and growing in that trust. So here's how we do it. We enjoy stewardship testimonies together. And haven't we had some great ones this month? And as I was reviewing um, David and Sylvia's, I just thought, Lord, thank you so much for people like that. Then we have a, a series of Sunday morning messages on the topic. There's just so much in the Word of God about stewardship. I'm so thankful for that. And then we print this um, stewardship commitment brochure, and we encourage every person in our church family um, to consider where you are in your stewardship and then to make written commitments about the steps of growth that you intend to take in coming days and months. 
And then we get together on the final Sunday night, which is tonight. Can you believe it? The Sunday night before Thanksgiving. And we just thank the Lord for all that he has done in and through us. I really believe when you look back over this year and think about all that has happened, shame on us, huh? If we don't spend time together as a church family corporately thanking the Lord. So that's what tonight is all about. It's a celebration of God's grace, a celebration of God's goodness, along with committing ourselves to uh, ongoing faithfulness if the Lord would give us the opportunity to continue to live for Him. So Stewardship Month, very, very important part of what goes on around this church. All of it starts by knowing the four factors of stewardship. Do you have them memorized at this point? I hope everybody does. If you don't, there's your afternoon homework assignment number one, to be sure that you know the four factors of stewardship. God owns everything and you own nothing. That God entrusts you with, with everything that you have. You can either increase or diminish what God's given you. He wants you to increase it. And you can be called into account at any time, and it may be today. This month, we just decided to, to concentrate each Sunday on one of those four aspects of stewardship. So last week, we talked about the delightful possibility of increasing what God has given to us. Well, this morning, we're going to look at the fourth factor. We're going to talk about preparing to give a good account. Preparing to give a good account. Now, now we've been looking at, at various aspects of this key stewardship principle in Matthew um, chapter 25, this parable that God has given, and we're going to be back there eventually. However, what I want us to do at the beginning is to think about the larger context in which this particular parable was given. Bible students refer to Matthew chapter 24 and 25 as the, the Olivet Discourse. The reason for that is going to become obvious in a moment. So we're just days before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Let's listen into what is being discussed. And remember, this is the context in which the stewardship parable of Matthew 25 is given. So in Matthew 24, verse 1, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple building to him. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us that when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And the Mount of Olives was, was directly across from the temple in Jerusalem. And so the disciples asked Jesus, when would the end times occur and what would it be like? And it's not our purpose this morning to try to study each one of these verses. Time wouldn't allow that. But it is amazing how many of these details dovetail so well with what we studied earlier this year in our verse-by-verse -verse exposition of the book of Daniel. And I realize a number of our small groups have also been working their way through the book of Revelation. So when you put Daniel and Revelation and the Olivet Discourse, it all fits together in some very, very important ways. What I want to do is just point out a couple of important themes that make it easier for us then to understand the key emphasis of our stewardship parable. So let's go a little further. Look at verse 4 now of chapter 24. And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you're not frightened, for those things must take place, but that's not yet the end, for, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Fascinating statement. Then they'll deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and will, you'll be treated, you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Now notice that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Now, now we can say a lot about that. But I want to encourage you to focus on what you saw right there in verse 14. The, the message of the gospel is being shared with all the nations. What is our theme this year? 
loving our, our world and even just days before Jesus is going to go to the cross to die for our sin, he's focused on how his death, burial, and resurrection would comprise good news. That's what the gospel is, good news for all who would repent and believe, just like David and Sylvia affirmed in their testimony. Now let's jump ahead for sake of time to verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there'll be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. That takes us back to that original question. When is this going to happen? What was Jesus' answer? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. By the way, and I don't want to make this true broad this morning, but you may remember even after the resurrection of Christ, just prior to his ascension, what was it that the disciples were still asking him about? It was the same thing, Acts 1-6. So when they had come together, again, this is after the resurrection now, and they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And I don't know if the Lord ever just rolled his eyes, but that would have been a really good time for sure. Now, the next verse is what ends up being especially emphasized in our key parable in chapter 25. So please pay careful attention to what we're just going to read now, beginning in verse 42. Therefore, be on the alert. If you're saying, where is all this going? That's where it's going. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know at which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into for this reason. You also must be ready. You getting the point? For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. In other words, don't concern yourself with exactly when is this going to happen. Concern yourself with what? Being prepared. Being prepared now, now, chapter 25, it actually, it begins with a tragic story of some who weren't. You might want to ask yourself, which category do you find yourself in as I read this? Matthew 25, 1, then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent, for when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now, when the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy. You've noticed that theme too, haven't you? People just falling asleep because they weren't prepared, and they began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. The prudent answered, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I, I don't know you. That's what happens to persons who are unprepared. I, I don't know you. Then the point, <coughs> be on the alert. How many times have we read that? Be on the alert, for, for you do not know the day or the hour. Well, the point's obvious. What separated the foolish virgins from the prudent ones was whether or not they were prepared. I mean, how terrible would it be to live one's life? And then hear the words of verse 12, truly I say to you, I, I do not know you. Now, it's in that setting that we receive this great stewardship parable. Let's just read a little bit of it this morning. Verse 14, for it's just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. 
Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who had received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, here's what I want you to especially focus on. Now, verse 19. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and he, he settled accounts with them. He settled accounts with them. And this morning we're talking about preparing to, to give a good account. And with the time we have remaining, we're going to take from these verses that we've been reading and look for three reasons why stewards are, are always prepared. Friend, are you prepared? That's the question. Three reasons why stewards are always prepared. Well, one is because we never know how much longer we have to serve. See, that is the fourth principle of stewardship. You can be called into account when? At any time. At any time. And it may be, it may be today. Ask David and Sylvia Anderson if that's true. Ask the pastor or the family of Pastor Lefeu. See, ultimately, no one knows when the master will return. That's what was so frustrating to the disciples, by the way. As he's sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And we saw earlier, they asked that exact same question later after the resurrection. Why was that so important to them? And we can't read their minds, but it very well could be because that makes it extremely easy to be prepared, right? Tell me when I have to be ready. (laughs) That's why pop quizzes are so irritating. (laughs) Because with a pop quiz, you have to what? You have to always be ready, huh? Who was that? You have to always be ready. You see this emphasis repeatedly in the Olivet Discourse. Did you notice, like, chapter 24, verse 36? But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven. Amazingly, not even the Son, the Father alone. Verse 42, therefore be on the alert. Is that what you are this morning? Therefore be on the alert, for you don't know which day your Lord is coming. Or uh, 25, 13, be on the alert then. For you don't know the day nor the hour. See, you can be called into account at any time, and it may be today. Now, now I hope everybody who is listening to this message this morning will especially hear this. The, The sobering corollary to what we're studying is his return will catch some off guard. Right? Verse 44, this reason you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you don't think he will. So if you're listening to this this morning thinking, well, I don't think this is going to happen. Or I don't think it's going to happen today. You realize you just increase the likelihood that it will. Our adversary doesn't have to get you to say no to what he wants you to do or what God wants you to do. He just has to get you to say later, later, I'll do that later. And I want to say to you this morning as a pastor who loves the fire out of you, don't be like one of those foolish virgins, believing that you'll always have more time to decide, or you'll always have more time to be prepared. In fact, let me ask you to look at your stewardship commitment brochure. We're going to look at that several times this morning, of course. And just think about where you are in each one of these areas in your personal growth and the commitments that you're making and in your giving and the commitments you're making and the serving opportunities on the back and the the commitments that you're making. And then consider this. What if you were called into account today? What if you were called into account today Wait, what if you were called into account before the end of the year? What if you were called into account before next stewardship month rolls around? You know, that's especially true if you have never trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. And you might say, well, what, are you, what are you trying to scare me? Well, I don't think I'm trying to scare you, but I guess I'm trying to put the fear of God in you. Here's what the book of Hebrews says about that point. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says today, when? 
today. If you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Take care, brethren. Take care that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And that context is speaking about individuals who were around the gospel, who were around God's people, but who had never genuinely repented and believed. And by the way, you might have said when David and Sylvia Anderson were giving their testimony, I'm not sure I like that guy up there on that screen telling me I ought to repent and believe. (laughs) Well, Well, guess what? I think David Anderson was loving you this morning. And if you've never trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, I hope you don't think, I'll take care of that tomorrow or I'll take care of that later. Friend, I want to urge you. You could be called into account at any time. And it may be, it may be today. Why not run to the loving, merciful arms of our forgiving Lord and place your faith and trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ right now while you have the opportunity to do so? See, we have no assurance of tomorrow. And this is, by the way, when you think about how this applies to believers in Christ, it's one of the reasons why I'm so glad to see young people embracing the opportunity to serve with their youth. So it's not like, well, eventually I'll choose to serve God. No, no, right now, right right now. So, So you saw a bunch of our young people weekend after weekend this summer down in the North End serving there. You saw another group of them head off to the country of Albania and serve in that place, they seem to understand John 9, 4, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. I appreciate college students who have that same attitude. And I understand college students kind of need to get a degree. My mom and dad probably be upset if you didn't place any focus on that. But if you're a wise steward, you can do well in your studies, and you can also effectively serve God while you're doing that. And I'm glad for the many college students in our church who that's the way they're choosing to live. Some of you are Facebook friends with me, and you'll notice that there's a number of people who post things that um, are from New Jersey. Well, I had the privilege when I was in college. That was a busy time. In busy time, I was working one or two jobs along with going to school full-time. It was busy time. But I had a Christian service where every Friday afternoon, jumped in my car and headed down to Trenton, New Jersey, about two and a half hours away, and I was the weekend youth pastor for a church that couldn't afford one. I said, how'd you get the job? They couldn't afford one. In fact, they couldn't even afford to pay my miles, but I thought it was a great opportunity just to serve God and work with young people. And it was so delightful to see some of the young people in that area come to place their faith and trust in Christ and to see others grow during their teenage years. And one of the, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago, 30 years ago. And now one of the great things is to see some of them, in fact, many of them, continue to live for God and continue to talk about it. It's amazing how many of them are now working in their church's youth ministries. So so I'm not planning on apologizing for encouraging college students to serve like right now. Work while it's day. And for the day may come, will come when no one can work. And I'm glad for people, regardless of their age, who just live as if they believe this fourth principle of stewardship. You may, uh, you'll be called into account at any time, and it may be today The point is, we want to avoid this. Well, I'll focus on wise stewardship after such and such mentality. You know, I'll start working on stewardship after I finish school. Or I'll start focusing on stewardship after I get married. Or after I land my first job. Or after Johnny learns how to walk. Or blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're not careful, you'll find a reason in every stage of your life not to be an effective steward. Right? Right? You can be called into account at any time. Nelda Byers, a dear, dear senior saint in this church, she was at the hospital this week 
She was with her son who was going into surgery, and her daughter was there um, to support her, her brother. And her daughter um, just happened to check Facebook and saw a post on Facebook that her husband had just died in an automobile accident on I-65 this week. She learned about it on Facebook. Can you, um, just, I want you to just think about what that'd be like, where you're there for your brother's surgery, you're there with your mama, and you receive news like that in that, in, uh, anybody here ever been on I-65? Anybody here ever driven down to that airport? Her husband worked for Delta. Anybody here ever done that? We, we've all done that, right? Anybody ever been going too fast? Anybody ever been a little bit tired when you were driving? Anybody ever check? I'm not even going to ask. You may be called into account at any time. That, that's why there's folly in the notion that, well, I'll get concerned about wise stewardship later. Now, now here's a second reason from this text. It's because the day will come when the accounts will be settled. That's a very powerful statement in verse 19 of our key uh, stewardship parable. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came, and what did he do? And what will he do? Settle the accounts. Settle the accounts. You see, that's when faithfulness will truly be determined. You realize you, you can't look at somebody else now and know exactly what has been entrusted to them. You know that? Anyway, we, we can have some idea, I suppose, but we don't know about one another's past. We don't know what's going on on the inside. We don't know what opportunities may have been ignored. There's only one person qualified to settle the accounts. And I just want to be honest with you as a pastor, for some people who will hear this message today, that's really good news. And for others, it's not. It's not. Because that's when the true motivation of our work will be revealed. You say, well, how's this settling business going to happen? Is God going to measure what I did for him with a scale? Going to weigh it? Going to measure with a tape measure? Uh uh. No scale, no tape measure. What? Fire. That's the answer. 1 Corinthians 3 12. Now, if any man builds on this foundation with good, uh, gold, silver, precious stones, or, or wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. Well, how? How? For the day will show it because it's to be revealed with fire. Why fire? Well, here it is. Because the fire itself will test the, the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he's built on it remains, he'll receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet, yet as through fire. This is known in Scripture as the Bema Seat Judgment, or the Judgment Seat of Christ, as an image that was well known in New Testament times because that's where the Bema seat, that's where rewards were distributed after an athletic context. But in this case, our work is tried by fire, which is why Paul would say in the very next chapter, another great stewardship passage, therefore don't go on passing judgment before the time. Wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in darkness, my and disclose the, the motives. That's why you have to have the fire, because it's all about motivation. Disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. That's when what is hidden shall be revealed. In Matthew 10, 26, Therefore don't fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. See, so much of our, let's just face it, so much of our relationship with the Lord, it's done in secret, right? It's done, done, and others don't really know. Well, the day the accounts are settled, the day the Lord comes, all of that is to be revealed. In fact, let me ask you, go back to this now, would you? Let's let the Word of God help us in, in practical ways to look at where you are in your personal growth and where you hope to be and where you are in your financial giving and where you hope to be and where you are in your serving opportunities and, and where you hope to be. And here's what I want to ask you, friend. In fact, I think I'd be less than a pastor if I didn't ask you this. Now, what would happen if one or more of those areas was settled today? 
So that's what it's all about. When the master comes, the accounts are settled. What would happen if one or more of those accounts was settled today? Today. Now, now, let me just address a question I'm often asked. In fact, I was asked this in Intro to Faith a couple of weeks ago. I am often asked this. This person says something like, hey, hey, I've heard around town. You know where this is going? I've heard around town that if you become a member of faith, you have to, you have to bring in your tax returns. <laughs> or they send you a bill every month, and they tell you how much you're supposed to give financially. You know, I've been hearing things like that for 29 years. I heard about that not long after I came to this church. Been hearing about it ever since. Urban legends die hard. But there are, you probably have to. People in this town have said exactly that same thing to you. Well, the answer is no, that's not true. We've never demanded anybody's tax returns. Thought maybe a presidential. Well, let's not get into that. But, but, but never, never demanded any, no, never done that. Never sent anybody a, a, a bill, a, a bill. But. Without apology, I do want to say to you, the Bible talks a lot about money and what you do with the finances that God has entrusted to you says a lot, not a little, a lot about the nature of your relationship with him. And it's my job to teach the the whole counsel of God. And by the way, it's not like that's just new, this financial giving, that's always been part of God's relationship with his people. For example, all the way back in Genesis 14, long before the law, hundreds of years before the law, just a few chapters after God called Abraham and began a relationship with him. If you know your Bible, Genesis 14 is a fascinating chapter because that's when God allows Abraham to win what is known as the Battle of the Kings. And the fact that a man like Abraham was able to win such a substantial battle is fascinating fascinating, and there's not a whole lot of detail in the text about exactly how he did it, but here's what we do read, Genesis 14, 14, when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he let out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Don't you love that 300, how how specific the Bible is? And went in pursuit as far as Dan. He, He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them. And he pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and all the women and the people. Then after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer, the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shiva, that is the, the king's valley. Now, now listen to this. And Melchizedek, this guy just shows up. We see him in the book of Hebrews, but he just comes on the scene. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now, he was a priest of God Most High. In Genesis 14, he's a priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who's delivered your enemies into your hand. And what did Abraham do in response? He gave him a tenth of all. It's amazing that that the principle of tithing, uh, the principle of giving a tenth of what had been received back to the Lord was already embedded in the people of God as early as Genesis 14. But it's at least possible, possible, that that wasn't even the first mention of the importance of giving in Scripture. Well, how could it have been any, any earlier than Genesis 14? We'll go back to Genesis 4. You remember Cain? Remember that story? Cain's offering. What was wrong with Cain's offering? You ever wondered about that? Here's the backstory: Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel, were told to bring an offering to God. And so Abel brought, brought what kind of an offering? An offering of meat. And Cain brought from the fruit of the ground. And what happened? God accepted Abel's offering and he what? He rejected Cain's. Now, we know, we know God had to have given previous instructions. It would, have been, um, it would have been wrong for God to reject Cain's offering without some sort of prior instructions. We also know that the book of Hebrews refers to Abel's offering as an offering of what? Of faith, 
Well, there is no such thing as faith, biblically, apart from commands from God in which to believe. So apparently, whatever those instructions were, Abel followed them and Cain did not. So it comes back to our original question, what was it that was wrong with Cain's offering that caused God to reject it? Genesis 4 doesn't tell us for sure, but we do know this. We know what people around the time of Christ thought about that. So how, how could we possibly know that? Because did you know that your Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew for the most part, was actually translated into Greek around the time of Christ? Why was that so important? Because so many people at the time of Christ spoke Greek that they translated the Old Testament into Greek around the time of Christ. You might say, who cares? You ought to care a lot because that tells you how people around the time of Christ interpreted their Bible. By the way, what was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament called? It was called the Septuagint. It's a very valuable tool to study the Old Testament from that particular perspective. And there's no question about this. The translators of um, Genesis 4 in the Septuagint believe that what was wrong with Cain's offering was amount. He chose to reject what God had said, to disobey what God had said regarding the matter of amount. Well, how's that work around here? The concept of giving a tithe of our first fruits was codified in Old Testament law, and we find that over and over and over in the Old Testament. In fact, one of the sadder places in the Old Testament is right at the end in the book of Malachi, where God points out that his people were no longer obeying by giving a tithe of their offerings. And you remember what he said? He said, you're robbing me. Can you imagine God saying that of someone? You're robbing me. I remember dear Pastor Good, he had a great sense of humor. He had a way of making a point. I remember a few times he said to some folks, somewhat in jest and somewhat not, he said, you know, so-and-so, I wouldn't be able to kneel down and, and pray with you if you're at a need. And the person goes, why? why? Why not? Well, I'd be afraid you'd, you'd uh, reach your hand in, in my back pocket and try to get my billfold while we were praying. What do you mean, Pastor Good? Why, why would you think I would do that? Well, you're obviously robbing God in your lack of faithfully giving. And if you'd robbed God, you'd surely rob me. Well, you understand how the point was made. Sweet. Humorous, but definite. And that's exactly, and don't try to pretty that up, because Malachi 3 doesn't pretty that up. He said, you're you're robbing me. So now we're living under grace, which empowers us to do far more and far better than the law could ever achieve, huh? Could I get a mm mm-hmm on that? We could certainly achieve more. Um, by grace than the law ever could. So if you've ever wondered, where does this church get its money? Because I rarely talk about it. I rarely talk about it because I don't have to, but here's how. The average person around here views tithing as a starting point, and then they seek to, to grow in financial giving just like they grow in everything else. So there's all sorts of people who give sacrificially week after week after week, and they do that first of their first fruits, not of their leftovers. Now, the Lord, if you, if you look at that section in your commitment card, the Lord's entrusted us with a number of other ministries. You glad for that? Are you glad for all of the additional ministries God has entrusted to us? We, we, we all are. And through our general budget, we support many of them with a certain amount each month. That's where the tithes and offerings part comes into this equation. So we ask people to consider giving additionally each month to the various ministries that are listed in your side panel to help us fulfill our budgetary commitments to them. Now, we don't have one going on right now, but just to give you the whole package, every so often our church family decides to do a three-year capital campaign. That's how we built um, our community center at Faith East. That's how we built our community center at, at Faith West. And you said, wait a minute. Are you saying that there have been times in the history of this church where, where people have actually essentially been giving in three different ways at the same time? Absolutely. 
And so when you see these Facebook posts or you hear people yapping about, well, they have some special pipeline to some national organization, really? Where's that pipeline and what's that organization? We have what we have by the grace of God and by the faithful stewardship of our people. And see, for us, it's just a natural result of really believing this fourth principle. And by the way, I'll tell you this, I would not want to go to church with people who weren't serious about that, would you? I wouldn't want to go to Robert Baptist Church, would you? I want to go to church who, with people who are the real thing. I want to go to church with people who are authentic, and there's all sorts of people around here who really believe this fourth principle that we're talking about. God could call us into account at any time. And when the accounts are all settled, we want to be faithful in all areas, including the way we've used the money that God has entrusted to us. Now, let me just say something to you about that from the perspective of our staff. Obviously, there's a lot of money that gets spent around here in ministry. But I want to tell you, your staff members are very, very careful not to waste money. We talk a lot about the fact that anything that we're spending first had to be faithfully earned and generously given. Here's an example of that. Dave Arthur. Do you know Dave? Dave oversees our maintenance ministry and does a fabulous job. Dave became aware of a, a program right now. We have a bunch of these four-foot-long fluorescent tubes. We got them all over our campuses. And um, our electric bill, it'd make you cry. And, and the reason is, in part, because we do so much ministry. These buildings are all open all the time. And, and so Dave became aware of a, a program where you could replace those fluorescent bulbs with a LED light and, um, and potentially save our church's electric bill somewhere between thirty dollars to $40,000 a year. That, that's some worth checking on, huh? The challenge is it costs um, $200,000. It would cost $200,000 to replace every... That's a lot of those four-foot um, tubes all over these buildings, all over the place. But right now, there's a, the, the power company is providing a rebate if you choose to do that, and the maker of the bulbs is providing a, a rebate if you choose to do that. So you can apply for that program. I hadn't heard anything about it at all. Dave heard about it, asked if it was okay if we applied for it. We applied for it, and we were accepted, and they provided $195,000 toward the $200,000 replacement of all of our lights all over these campuses. So for a total of five thousand dollars of our funds we're going to have all of those replaced and then year after year after year we're going to be saving thirty thousand plus dollars in electric bill that's the kind of staff members we have and if you happen to see dave arthur today i would encourage you to smooch him hug him buy him a cup of coffee whatever you think is appropriate but that's stewardship that's stewardship now now we need to to land this plane because the possibility exists of hearing the words, well done. Isn't that what it comes down to, friends? You can be called into account at any time, and it may be today, and then what? His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. You know, as I think about the way Bob and Joan LeFew lived while they were here, many of you know, you saw it, you, you watched it. Was Bob LeFew a faithful servant? Was Bob LeFew a faithful steward? And was he called into account? And what do you think he heard from the lips of his Lord? The same words we all want to hear. Well done, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your word. And Father, it cuts against us because we want to be selfish. We don't want to be prepared. We want to be lazy. We don't want to give, we want to take, etc., etc., etc. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your spirit that makes it possible for us to choose to follow your word even when it's hard. And Lord, I thank you for a church filled with people who in many ways are faithful stewards. And I would pray, I would pray that we would consider these matters today, especially from the perspective of the day when the accounts will be settled. Lord, help us to live in a way in which we're well prepared in case that would be today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.